All right. Hello, everybody. Today we have a special guest on. His name is John Russin, and he is a professor of philosophy in Toronto. Uh, His work is, uh, I don't want to say all over the place, there's a real focus on Hegel, continental philosophy, and ancient philosophy. Uh, And he writes especially about existential phenomenology and a lot of, uh, a lot of, what I might say, lived experience approach um, topics. Yep. So um, I'll be linking to John's site uh, in the show description. And uh, today we're going to be talking about all sorts of things because that's because <laughs> John writes about basically everything. So uh, just to begin with, John, was there anything you wanted to tell the audience about yourself? Uh no, I mean, I think what you said is good, it, namely that uh, I'm really an existentialist. I uh, discovered at some point that that was the thing I believe, and I've pretty much devoted my life to um, trying to understand what that means and to try to interpret uh, our world in terms of that. So, uh, yeah, it's a perfect thing for me to talk about. Yeah, and I know you also do your own YouTube videos, which yeah. I, I've watched quite a few of. Um Right now, I think you're going over Plato's Republic, right? Yeah, yeah, I just finished that. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, that was a good, that was a that was a big job to read through that whole book and uh, construct a series of lectures. Also very rewarding, though. Yeah, and um, I think the the way I wound up originally contacting you is I was in just some argument uh, in a philosophy forum about whether or not Sartre was a Cartesian dualist and. I found an essay you had written, I don't know how long ago, and <laughs> reached out to you about it. So, yeah, come to find out how much work you've actually done on all this. Yep, yep. Uh, so your website and the Wikipedia actually is not quite up to date on uh, your published books. Um, there's a book you wrote recently called Adult Life. That's right, yep. And that's the one I'm... I'm most familiar with. Um, so uh, I guess the first question, since you're in Canada and there is a famous Canadian who writes about coming of age issues uh, named Jordan Peterson, would you consider this in some regards a response to the approach he has towards similar life uh, development? I mean, I, I only know of Jordan Peterson pretty uh, peripherally because you can't, you can't walk down the street and not not hear about him, but uh, but I, honestly, I've never paid very much attention to him. Um, so it's not it was not in any way intended as a um, as a kind of rejoinder or anything like that. Uh, but uh, but yeah, my, my sense is that uh, that I offer a somewhat different uh, view than the kinds of things he's talking about. But yeah, but I, but I honestly have never uh, I've never much engaged with him. Even though it's true, he's nearby. Yeah, I, I have not really engaged with him either, besides for the odd fact that when you look for lectures on YouTube yeah. about existentialism, especially Ludwig Binswanger, yep. he's pretty much like one of three people that come up. And what he has to say about it is also uh, incoherent. So That's, that's, uh, that's what I've uh, been led to believe, yeah. Um, are you familiar with Ben Zwanger, by the way? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, again, not. I mean, it's not Ben Zwanger is not someone I particularly studied, but but it's certainly been a little bit of my education because I was I'm very, been very I have been very interested in psychological development and mental health, and you know, existentialism, existential phenomenology, had a huge impact in that field in the 20th century. Uh, Especially, you know, initially through people like Binswanger. So, uh, so I know a little bit about Binswanger, but I'm no, I'm not a, I'm not an expert on it. Yeah, it's, and it's hard to be because his most important work re- remains to be translated into, <laughs> into at least into English. I don't know what other languages it might have been translated to. Something I've actually been trying to do on my own, but I don't know German, so. Yeah, well, that's that would be a a, a, a bit of a hassle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things he does, though, is he divides up experience in, into these three primary categories, Umwelt, Mitwelt, mm-hmm. and Eigenwelt. 
And uh, one of the things I noticed in your book, Adult Life, is you have an even further division of the social world or the the mitvelt into the, uh, yeah. I believe it was economy, family, and politics. Basically, yeah. Uh, would you, uh, in whatever way you want, kind of discuss why you think the social world fits that model so well? Yeah, uh, that's a good question, but also a, a big one. So I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, and that's that's an issue that I've been working on over quite a few years. It's come up like the, the point I end up making in adult life there is one that I have made a few other times in different contexts. I think uh, maybe if I approach it sort of historically, that is to say in terms of my own history, that might help. I early on got very um, taken by the contrast in in Greek culture and Greek thought between the oikos and the polis, the household and the city. I think I was first uh, alerted to that in a, my undergraduate in a mythology course when we read Sophocles' Antigone, where, you know, there's this great conflict between Antigone and her defense of the her family relationships and the values of the family against her uncle Creon, who's the head of the city, and there's big conflict between the needs of the city and the needs of her family. And since that time, which would have been about 1983, so quite a few years ago, uh, since that time, I uh, have thought a lot about that issue, fam family and city or oikos and polis. And um, so that's really where it started. And I, I you know, in, in the ancient Greek world, that's what the real cultural division is. That's what they're struggling about. Which which should come first, the city that is the representative of the needs of all of us, or particular family spheres? And one of the reasons that that is interesting, but one of the many reasons, is because in the modern world we tend to contrast the the state and the individual, or the city and the individual, rather than the city and the family. Right. And yeah. So, so I really, um, I really started to think about that. Like, uh, in each of those um, term, in each of those situations, there are two terms that are opposed to each other. But in fact, if you look at both of those together, there are three different terms: is the individual, the city, and the family. And I started thinking about that a lot about why, why it makes sense that in our culture, like in the whole history of our culture, we have come to recognize those as essential ways of thinking about ourselves, but also why, why they have to be differentiated and why they can be opposed. And then another, uh, another big influence on me was uh, reading Hegel's philosophy of right, uh, where he distinguished the family, uh, what he calls civil society, and the state. And I thought a lot about that too, why he marked those out as th three fundamentally different ways of thinking about how the human world should be understood and how it's organized. And these those two lines of thought, like the my thought about the Greeks in contrast to the modern world, and then my reading of Hegel, those things came together a lot of my thinking as I tried to pull those things together. And that's what led me ultimately to the view that we really do operate under fundamentally different definitions of who we are and who we are in relationship to other people. And those definitions, uh, you said family, which is fine. In the adult life, I use a slightly broader term, which is the domain of intimacy, because family, uh, while it's certainly an instance of that, can can seem to mean only certain particular people, but it, it's whereas in fact I think one of the most defining things about us is that our lives revolve around other individual people we are intimately connected to. It could be you know your romantic partner, it could be your children, could be your friends, could be your parents, but there we are individuals, or you know we're we're unique people, and the other unique ones matter, and and those ties. Um, affect us at our very core, right? And so there's a way that what relations of intimacy sort of put on display is, is the way we can't really separate who we are from other people, but specific ones in these specific relations. But then on the other hand, 
uh, we don't just live out of that identity because we also function in a world where there are lots of other people who aren't part of that, but those people matter to us too. And in interesting ways. And so, you know, in what we would typically think of as our work life, you know, you go to your job and, you know, you have colleagues, you have a boss, you have clients or whatever, suppliers, whatever you have to deal with those that that also constitutes for us an essential identity because we have to go out and earn a living and we can't escape the fact that we have to deal with other people under those definitions and in those contexts and so we kind of take on a different identity or a different role when we go out into our work life it's still a way of dealing with other people it's still me but there i don't function by the same rules I function by in my intimate relationships. Um, and so that second domain, excuse me, that second domain I call the domain of economics. And it seems to me that these are, are both essential. The domain of intimacy uh, is essential primarily because it's the most important thing for fulfilling and satisfying our most personal needs. Like we need to connect with other individuals as individuals. And that's where we have those interactions that make that make it rewarding to us to get through the day you know like that's 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 the stuff our life is about and you know who i am but we also have to have these other ones we are people who have to participate in a world with we have to participate in a world with others who are not our intimate friends and in that domain we have to interact with them such that we are all able to satisfy the material needs of life you know, working in the same material realm. And so that that domain, that's what I call the domain of economics because the identity we end up adopting there is rooted in our need to do constructive and worthwhile work to to fulfill ourselves and to provide for ourselves. But that, but that sets us into a different kind of identity. Uh, and then I, I contrast that, though, with then a third identity which is the political identity because yes when you enter into the economic sphere uh, or when you adopt your economic identity you're relating to people who are not your family but the rules that are governing why you're doing that and how you're doing that are really the rules of economics the rules of business the rules of the work world uh, and uh the rules of that world are not the same as the rules of intimate life and they can deeply conflict. In fact, you know, just in a familiar example, like the demands of your work can, you, you know, your, your work can say, you got to be away from home for X number of weeks out of the year to go traveling as a salesperson or whatever. And that doesn't fit well with your family life. It might ruin your marriage or your, your relationship with your children. And so, you, you know, we have to make decisions like, Am I going to stand by what my family needs and quit the job? Or am I going to stick by the job and make my family pay the price? But, you know, we, we have just in everyday life, we experience the fact that these different essential sides of who we are uh, conflict with each other. And we, you know, we have to make choices. But the domain of economics can be even more challenging because we're really talking about the world and we're talking about economics in, in this sense, we're talking about the world of people who are relating to the world and relating to others for the sake of, I mean, basically instrumentally for the sake of bringing out of that world, the resources they want for themselves. And so on its own, uh, that's a world governed by, uh, no obvious norm other than, uh, the desire to uh, to accumulate and uh, competition, friendly or unfriendly, uh, shaving things. So it's a pretty tough world. So anyway, finally, politics then, it seems to me, is another domain uh, where we have a different identity again, and that is the identity we inhabit, where we construe ourselves as, the, as a member of a group, where every member of that group has intimate family and intimate ties, other people's intimate ties are not ours. Like there's still people we don't know, but we're, we're relating to people we don't know, but we're not relating to them for the sake of economic instrumentality. We're also not relating to them for the sake of becoming intimate companions. We're, we're collectively getting together 
or in, anybody in the political sphere, properly speaking, is adopting the identity of being someone who's trying to work with others for the sake of the collective good, for the sake of determining what we as a community need to do to live well, which mostly means, or maybe I shouldn't say mostly, but in a pretty basic way means making judgments about how the conflicting demands of intimacy and economics are, are going to be allowed to come together. You know, what, what, how economic life is going to be regulated, how intimate life is going to be regulated and so on. And so, so I guess, uh, so finally, to answer your question most directly, I've come to talk about intimacy, economics, and politics in adult life as three sort of essential but distinctly different domains of the Mitveld, the world with other people, because it seems to me, as I've just been trying to put into words, we can see that our life really demands of us, our life with other people really demands of us, that we adopt these fundamentally different identities vis-a-vis -vis others. We can see that each one of them is essential, but we can also see that no one of them can be collapsed into the other. And so I, I think that, you know, if there's, if, the, if there's a single issue that is most defining of who we are, it is that each of us has to learn how to uh, adopt and balance those identities. And there, you know, there are healthy and unhealthy ways of doing it. There are honest and dishonest ways of doing it, et cetera, et cetera. But it seems to me that's that's who we are as people in a world with other people. We're we we're individuals who have to acknowledge the reality of our intimate economic and political sides and learn how to integrate them one with another in a responsible and healthy way. So it's kind of a long-winded answer, but <laughs> no, I mean that it's necessary though, because so much of what uh, you have to say is gonna need that background. Um, so someone else who uses similar categories is the uh, the philosopher Hannah Arendt. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that comes out of her work is that these divisions between the economic, the intimate, and the political are historically uh, developed. And mm -hmm. now we have something which she would call society, which is sort of this blurred line between the political and the economic, yeah. which uh, her complaint is that this interferes with what the notion of free action would be in yeah. the polis. And... <clears throat> Uh, following just on that comparison, what uh, what would you recognize as some of the consequences of the type of society we live in now yeah. and the way that uh, these structures have emerged? Yeah. Again, there's a <laughs> there's a lot in that question, but I'll do I'll do my best. Um, and let me just say, as an aside, I think your reference to Hannah Arendt is a good one. I think I think she is particularly good at sort of defining that unique domain of the political and and precisely the relationship between that and free action. So I think you I think you're right. The thing she's talking about is very much um, what's on my mind, and that actually maybe leads into this answer. Like all of those domains, the intimate, the economic, and the political, uh, are going to those sides of our life are going to function better if we're sort of creative and, and uh, engaged, but probably the economic is the one that you can most straightforwardly deal with, uh, you know, by a rule book or, or sort of by rote, like you can just get a job, do what you have to do, earn money. There's, there's a way you can fulfill that. Certainly there are richer ways of engaging with that domain, like uh, fuller ways. No, no question about it. But but you can get by just treating the economic realm as a place where you have to satisfy basic needs in a simple way. In intimate life, if you adopt that kind of role, your relationships are going to be shallow and unsatisfying. Like intimacy really demands of us that we bring ourselves to it. And it seems to me politics is like that too, that the political domain is like the intimate domain is the domain where 
what we're really called upon to do is sort of try to s- step up and think responsibly, respons- responsibly and responsively uh, about uh, what's going on in our world and what should we do about it, right? So it's it really, to to engage politically really requires us to be informed, concerned, and um, you know, critically reflective, exercising judgment. So I think that's I think that's what politics is about. It's it's a like I think that I think the the use of images of the family as a metaphor for politics is a bad thing. I don't think you should compare the state to a big family. I think that's that's pretty counterproductive. But there is one thing about it that's right, and that is that it is the domain where you I think to do it well you have to function as a responsible creative individual thinking about the good of other people as opposed to just being someone adopting the role of being a machine or a robot or something like that. So the problem with one, one of the biggest problems with our contemporary world, I think is that the domain of the political has mostly disappeared from people's experience that we people imagine politics to be to the extent that they think about it at all. They, they think of it as something that somebody else is taking care of. And they imagine they're being political if they decide which party they're going to support or they cast their ballot or they give $50 donation or whatever it is. Um, And I certainly don't mean to suggest that there is nothing relevant about party affiliation. (laughs) Some parties I'd like people to belong to and other ones I'd like them not to belong to for sure. And campaign donations are of significance and uh, people who are trying to do something good should vote as opposed to not voting, like there are ways in which those things matter. But that is such a profoundly impoverished view of what political life is. It, it, and it's precisely a view that, 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 that view that's encouraged of us, uh, encouraged in us in the contemporary world is really one that leads us to think, I don't have to do anything. This isn't about me. And even more, there's nothing I could do. You know, and so we we've come to uh, adopt as as a culture, as members of a culture, we've almost all of us come to adopt an extremely passive view towards politics and an extremely um, weak view of what we can and should do individually. And you know, I guess just to elaborate on a thing I already said, like when people do think politically, they almost always will look for the pre-established channel they can go through. Like, you know, who can I donate money to or whatever? Whereas what politics really calls for, for lack of a better word, is activism. It calls for people self-responsibly to think about what's going on in our society, to inform themselves and to try to meaningfully take action for the sake of furthering important causes in the name of the common good. And usually there aren't pre-established paths for that. You usually, you know, there are some pre-established paths where you can do something worthwhile, but really you have to be kind of creative and, and uh, work with other people to make things happen that nobody else is, you know, laying out, a, laying out the steps for as in your intimate life, you know, you got to meet people and make the, make your own relationships. So, yeah, I think, I think one of the, very greatest problems of our contemporary culture is the way that it's not just what politics has become, but it is the whole interpretation our society has of politics, or maybe I should say almost like the ideology or the rhetoric of politics or something like that, that we've come to adopt such that our relationship to politics is that we believe we don't have to be political or somebody else is going to take care of it or something like that. So I think, you know, in, in context of my book, Adult Life, I end up arguing that adulthood, which in its richest sense really means sort of self-responsibly trying to, you know, take charge of your own existence, you know, and engage meaningfully in the world. I argue that that in the richest development it dovetails nicely with the issue of citizenship or being politically active. So I, I think of being 
self-consciously responsive and responsible to work on behalf of the common good is something that's really demanded of anybody insofar as they're an adult. But I think that our contemporary culture, on the contrary, precisely encourages us to be childish in relation to non-adult in relation to politics. Yeah. And I think I think that's a view we adopt. I think it's what we have. But I also think there are just so many institutional things set out to tell you that's how you should think. And if you try to do something else, you're going to meet obstacles. Uh, and, you know, it's it's not going to be easy to be more directly engaged. So, yeah, I think, and, and actually, I had one last thing going back to your remark about Hannah Arendt. I think the real meaning of the political is something that's being sort of dishonestly concealed in our lives, the, in the sense I've been saying. But then I also think that in, in some ways, one of the more insidious sides of that is that the world of economics, the world of banks, the world of industry is allowed to take over governing, allowed to, is allowed to find the way into dictating public policy. Uh, and so where it should be that the human community intelligently governs itself, we have developed instead a situation where banks, uh, industry, and, you know, the contem world of contemporary technology, big pharmacy, and so on, uh, really dictates, dictates the term of public life and, and has effectively become government in place of really what should be there. So I, I agree with pretty much everything you said. Uh, I tend to call that phenomenon a politics of consumption or a consumer mm -hmm. politics or a consumer's yeah. approach to politics. Yeah, very much. And a lot, a lot of people uh, will uh, look at different factors and try to point out, you know, why it is our societies have become this way, whether it's the system of education in a particular country or uh, it's the incentives that the economic sector encourages or something about uh, individualism. Um, and I don't know where I rest on that because there's just so many factors, mm -hmm. but it is really uh, – a way in which the fullness of life is limited by um, brought by our presuppositions of what it is to be political. Yep, I think so. Um, so when you say this, um, one of the things that I know that you differentiate between is uh, this sense of being political and government or the mm -hmm. state. And uh, you've made a lot of interesting distinctions in, in your book, um, especially when you start talking about the history of money and you, oh, yeah. you really get into uh, the details of just how it is these hidden structures shape our ideas of what is possible, which is a big topic right now yeah. on the left. Um, what do you think some of the big uh, the big obstacles are, uh, whether it's education or if you could name only a few of them? <laughs> yeah, I mean all the ones all the ones you named. Um, yeah, that's a that's uh, uh, let me answer in a couple of pieces, and, and it, it may or may not end up being really direct, but. Uh, uh, I'll start from a slightly different point. Um, you know, you mentioned my discussion of money in adult life, which is uh, pretty serious. I, I had written a good part of that book before, but I couldn't finish it until I spent a lot of time studying the history of money, trying trying to figure out how to complete, how to understand and complete this section on economics. And uh, so I'm quite a, I'm quite happy about that, and I feel like I learned I learned a lot about that and. In some, you know, in a lot of ways, there my inspiration is Marx. Like Marx, I mean, and Adam Smith before him, but but most famously, Marx. You know, really, as if you want to understand how, how a society is running, you've got to understand the economics. And I, you know, many people say that that they're that they're operating with that view, but I think not that many people really get into the study of money. 
you know, really, and, and what has been happening in the last couple of centuries and, and how money works. And so I, I undertook that study and, and I feel like it was eye opening. I learned a lot and I learned a great deal about the real intimate connections between capitalism and the industrial revolution and banking and just seeing something about how these are inseparable realities. And anyway, just as a side note and sort of a plug for myself, that's what I'm currently finishing a book on, on that same topic. But that also part is part of the answer to my, to your question. I think not so much in terms of the, you know, when you're talking about education and so on, you're talking about sort of the causes of people's attitude. But before addressing that, I would say, I think the things that I think are the most pressing issues such that if you're not addressing these, you're not going to be addressing the thing that's really shaping where the world is going. There, I think probably the two biggest issues are banking and digital culture, like the internet. And so that's what I've been trying to write about and try, trying to study. And the thing that is so striking to me about both of them is that when I look around me, I don't know if I see anybody who I think of as even in a basic way, understanding either what banking is or what digital technology is. Um, so as I say, I undertook some of that study and it took you know, me some years of reading books and trying to learn stuff to feel like I started to see what's really going on there. And I, I think, so in, in a way, go, now going back to your question, I think, I think in a certain sense, education is the most pressing con issue and the, and the most pressing or the most important reason for why we might be in trouble. But I, but I mean that in a few specific ways. I think one of the most striking things is that these most pervasively important things in shaping our world, money and the internet, are things used by every single person around us. And they're used in almost complete ignorance of what they are. Like, you know a little bit about what that thing will get you. You don't know how it works. You don't know where it came from. You don't even know what the significance is of the thing you're doing beyond the fact that you're about getting this chocolate bar when you exchange this $5 bill or whatever it is. And so people learn a lot. And, you know, it's, it's people in general are pretty smart. You know, they learn a lot about chemistry. They learn a lot about, I don't know, raising their children. They learn a lot about playing football. They learn a lot about driving cars. Like people... People can be quite smart and they can be quite sophisticated in their way of, way of dealing with all kinds of things. But, I, but I'm really struck by how much, at least that it seems to me, that these domains that are at the cutting edge of what's happening in the world are not domains that people are becoming competent to deal with. When I was growing up, like I was a kid in the 1960s, uh, you know, my dad could fix the car. And he sort of understood a little bit about how the TV worked, but he sure couldn't fix it. And I sure couldn't, you know, and that was TVs in the 1960s, you know, like, what about these things? You know, what, who understands that? Like some people do, some of the people who make them, but uh, they're the functioning of this thing. You, one depends on a thousand times a day is almost infinitely far from the comprehension of the person using it. And so I think it's the, I think that is maybe the most dangerous uh, epistemological, for lack of a better word, disparity in or educational disparity in our world is the extent to which we are not actively coming to understand these things that shape our world and certainly not being actively encouraged to. And then I would connect that also with other issues in education, I think, um, I think what people need is education. I don't think they just need to learn about the internet. I mean, people need to learn about what human beings are and how to live a healthy and responsible life. And so, I, I think generally the greater support for, you know, basically a liberal arts education, and considerably less emphasis on what they call STEM topics, you know, science, technology, engineering, and math, or whatever it is, 
Like, I think the I think we live in a society that has the balance of those things really wrong. I think what we would benefit from immensely is greater social emphasis, government emphasis on education in the liberal arts, the arts of, of freedom. And then within that context, I think uh, it would be great if people who were getting that kind of education had it occur, occur to them that they should be trying to understand these mysterious things like money and the internet. I mean, I think the reason people typically don't understand them is not because they wouldn't want to, but it's like what I was saying about participation in politics. Like, it's just such a tremendous different distance between what it's relatively straightforward for you to learn and what those other things are. And it, it's such a steep wall you have to climb to learn the secrets of those things, partially because they've been kept secret, you know, like they're not, uh, you know, when people were building computers in the 1940s, they were building them largely for the sake of being able to figure out how to make a hydrogen bomb, you know, to do the calculations that would let them figure out how that thing would work, you know, and so it was top secret enterprise and, it, and computers were funded in their development almost exclusively in, in, in the United States, almost exclusively to the extent that it, it could be shown that they were going to contribute to the development of the hydrogen bomb. And in Britain in the 1940s, they were being developed to break the codes so that they could, you know, figure out where the German U-boats were and stuff. But, um, but I guess my point there is the very development of that technology is wrapped up. They were wrapped up in highly secret things. And there's a sense in which they have remained the privileged sphere of people who are trying to run run the world, not always in ways they want others to be involved in, you know? So anyway, so that doesn't directly answer your question, but those are, I guess, but those are, those are the, the, the things that ultimately I think we need to know about. And I think that's part of the issue of education. But I also then, as I say, think the issue of education is bigger. I think uh, we should belong, we should have a world that recognizes how important human freedom is and works to cultivate in people the ability to understand and engage with and develop their freedom. And instead that kind that that side of education is uh, you know certainly underfunded, probably worse, it's often sort of suppressed or threatened with elimination in favor instead of channeling education in the direction of those kinds of, developing those kinds of skills that will allow you to participate effectively in the already existent, you know, economic world and in the perpetuation of its, of its form and character. So if there were one place where I could, where I would say, here's, here's what I would like to try to change it, it definitely would be education. So oddly enough, um, I, uh, I thought you would probably say something about the phenomenology of money and the phenomenology of using technologies like smartphones and yeah. and things like that, which I think is also an underexplored uh, For sure. topic uh, besides just the technical aspects. I'm in the tech industry, so that part I'm familiar with. But, you know, the experience of the user of these things, whether it's sure. money or or uh, or a smartphone. And um, there's plenty of studies about how video games impact behavior, how you know social media is influencing behavior, but they're not really phenomenological studies. Yeah. And um, anyway, yeah, I thought uh, that <laughs> being your field. <laughs> I mean, I, I totally agree with you. And that is a thing that is always on my mind. I mean, and, and just sort of in a in a word, I think again, so much of contemporary internet culture, social media, and so on, and so much of you know money in the sense of in its forms of, you know, credit cards, uh, internet payment, PayPal, all the rest. Those again are like again, sort of as I was saying about politics. There's so many of those structures that encourage passivity. Um, a, a sort of a spectator's role as opposed to a participant's role. They encourage us to a kind of isolated individuality and just detachment from uh, more direct engagement with our, with our others and with the world. So, yeah, I think there, that 
there's a tremendous amount of worthwhile stuff to say about the phenomenology, like the just the description of the experience of dealing with these things and what impact it has on you. I think that's right. And I, I guess the reason that I haven't focused on that is because I, I think, wow, there are some really basic structural things about how these things work in our society that uh, have to be understood first. You know, there, there are huge issues at stake in the way these things have developed as social institutions. But um, yeah, so that so, so the fact that I didn't talk about it or haven't written about it that much in no way reflects a sense that it's not important. I think that's hugely important. And, and uh uh, I I think it's possible that in this new book I'm talking about I may I may take it in that direction eventually, especially now that you've brought it to my attention. Let's talk about this phenomena, uh, this pervasive passivity, yeah, uh, just a little bit more because something I've been thinking about lately is um, how much different it is to sell something than it is to buy something, and uh, so I'm reading a history of salesmanship which Mm -hmm. is somewhat distinct from peddling uh, Mm -hmm. and other things like that. And there is, that is, um, it seems like along with political activism and along with maybe being a technologist oneself oneself and, you know, building the technology and things like that. uh, For the most part, living in a consumer society, uh, the active aspect of that is when you're a salesman or a salesperson. And uh, I haven't seen that explored a lot. How, because, you know, when you think about old or not old, but when, if you think about a hunter gatherer society, uh, gathering is pretty intuitive. I mean, uh, buying is sort of analogous to gathering. Uh, These packed, a lot of activities are similar to gathering shopping um but the active part the hunting you really don't see that until you get to sales and i was going to do a whole uh series of uh episodes but i still might but um i don't know where i'm going with that i think i just was wondering what kind of yeah i I do have a few thoughts about that I, i mean i think your point is good i think that the initial point about buying and selling is good and i think your comparison to hunter gatherer is is really good um yeah, in in adult life, I didn't direct directly address that issue of selling, but I did do something similar. Like I talk a little bit about, you know, what it would be if you approached, you know, the economic world essentially as an entrepreneur, as opposed to someone just getting a job. And it's not identical with selling, but it's similar in the sense that your success is going to depend on you generating the enterprise that's essentially going to employ you and it's got to get some traction. Other people have to accept it, right? As opposed to you being some hired by someone so that you're already set in an institution or something like that. And yeah, so I, and I, I think the point you make is a very good one that few, few of us approach the economic world as entrepreneurs or as as sellers, you know, we, we generally, people generally try to find a place where they can slot themselves into an already existent structure so that they don't have to struggle with the demands of, of economic life. And I mean, there are lots of good reasons for that. So I I don't, I don't mean to say one shouldn't do that, but it's, but it's important to see that that attitude by itself would not generate the economic world we live in. Like that's, you can get those jobs only because someone else is being much more active, you know? And so, you know, again, you talk about buying and selling. I I think of that similarly, just at the level of books, you know, I can buy books like crazy. I have a shelf with, you know, a couple of hundred right there. um, And a few, a couple of hundred right behind me too. But, uh, you know, I write a book, which, big, which is already a big bit of work, more so than reading. But then I got to sell it in the sense that I got to get somebody to publish it and then hope that somebody's actually going to read it. And doing that really makes me notice the difference between those two sides, just as you say. And, you know, when I look at any of the books I see, first of all, having done that, having written books myself, it changes my sense of what those things are that I'm seeing. Like, I remember a person had to do this 
and they had to go through things. And it also affects my sense a bit when I think, oh, and that book has been read and has been famous for, you know, 500 years. I think that, you know, I don't know if that's going to happen to any of mine, but it does. But, you know, I, you start to see a little bit more of what the phenomenon is. Anyway, to get back to your point about buying and selling, I, I think the, the point I was trying to make there is, is that, uh, yeah, there really is an asymmetry between trying to engage in this thing actively and thereby producing the thing that other people will take up versus engaging in it passively where you essentially consume the things other people brought. And uh, the, by the asymmetry, I really mean when you're in the consuming side, everything's easy. Everything's there for you. You know, it's almost like pushing a button. When you're in the selling side or the making side, uh, everything is a risk. Nothing is assured. And, you know, you've got, got only this, only you and your thing, and you are having to find something that's going to accept it. So, um, so you're much more obviously reliant upon other people supporting you and working with you and all the rest. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I, I don't have a lot more to say about the particular value of selling or something like that, but I think that's a, you're right to point to that as a particularly important phenomenon for showing something about what's what what is really involved in economic life and what has to be there for there to be an economic world but but it shows that side but that's the side most of us never have to acknowledge and never participate in because we adopt that passive consumerish stance okay. so i think you're, you're right to point to that as a and we're as not a important oh, we're not talking about the techniques of of selling or if you put it into the educational system you know the technique of teaching right. which would be sort of the the analogy in that that domain um so okay so let's change gears a little bit sure. so you're a hegel uh uh scholar that's where i started, that's where I started and, yeah and um hegel's really coming back into uh influence on the left a lot of it because of zizek yeah and um i personally haven't read a lot of hegel uh my bridge to hegel would be sartre yep but I'm wondering where you, wh what is what is your relationship with Hegel now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Hegel Hegel is brilliant. He's great. Uh, I I think uh, anybody who wants to do serious study will benefit immensely from studying Hegel. But uh, but kind of like this point about selling, it's it's not it's not an easy thing. You could just walk in and buy off the shelf. Like you got to invest a lot to be able to make sense of his books. But if you can bring that to it, they, they have a great deal. Um, Hegel, you know, when you, when you, when you read contemporary academic writers talking about Sartre or Marx or Hegel or Merleau Ponty or Heidegger, or whatever, um, it, it, the most normal thing, if you read a journal article with two of those names in it, um, will will be that you will there will be some claim in that article about why one of them disagrees with the other about some point or other. So I think the common way these figures are taken up in contemporary academic life is to to imagine them as as sort of competitors and people arguing with each other and disagreeing. And the, the, I don't uh, I don't have that view. Um, my my experience of reading these figures, Hegel. Heidegger, Sartre, uh, is that um, I I think of them, it may, there may be differences here and there, but mostly I think of what is so striking is how much they're trying to do the same thing. Uh, and, you know, the things I've been trying to say here are one version of what I think they're all trying to talk about. The, these are people who all, 
you know, Hegel at the beginning and, you know, Sartre much later, but they were all witnesses to the industrial revolution and the, the new world that was brought into being after the French revolution and so on. And they are people who also, well, and so they're, they're witnesses to the industrial revolution. They've, they're living in the, the changed political world that was brought about by things like the French revolution. Uh, the industrial revolution itself is premised on the scientific revolution of the, let's say 1600s. So they're, you know, two or 300 years away from that, looking at that too. They're, they're all people who, I mean, they're not different from me or they're not different from you. Like they all live in this world we live in where starting with Hegel, they have seen the scientific revolution and what it brought the new political world and what it's bringing. It's an industrial revolution. And they're, they're all uh, really insightful in talking about what those historical realities are, why, why and how they've brought about this new human world we inhabit. And they're all people who are really focused on this unique the unique character of human existence where the fact that we're free means uh, basically means we have a hand in our own existence. You know, we've got to make the communities and we've got to govern them ourselves. And we also have to make our own individual lives meaningful. And so they, these are all philosophers who have a very rich sense of that, of human freedom in a very, the very concrete sense of what human freedom is and what it means and then they look at the relationship between these things. Like we are people who need to develop rewarding lives individually and socially. And we live in the context of these revolutions in modern culture. And they, they are all people who can look at those. I guess they're all people who can do two things. They're all people who can, on the one hand, look at human freedom, both as it relates to individuals and to society and reflect quite profoundly on what it what it takes to fulfill or develop that freedom and on the other hand what are predictable sort of pitfalls and problems that we encounter so that's sort of on the uh, for lack of a better word abstract side of human life or the sort of what human life is in principle but then there are also people who are really learned and insightful in thinking about the realities of our contemporary global historical human situation and looking at the way those things uh, simultaneously facilitate and inhibit the possibilities for development and healthy living that we have as individuals in society. And, you know, so they, um, <clears throat> they're all brilliant. Hegel, Heidegger, Sartre, to my mind, rather than having different things they're arguing about, are just are three different people who see basically that same thing, and almost like like great artists or like great painters, like they have their way of doing things. And Hegel, well, you know, Sartre is just so um, so f smart in his ability to talk about just kind of the fine grained ways people think and act and, you know, what's going on when you're making this kind of decision. And he's, he's so powerful at bringing, being able to bring out like how your experience works and unfolds at a minute by minute level and relating that to what it means to live a healthy life or a rich life, you know, and Hegel, Hegel, you know, does a version of that, but not, not, he doesn't have that same particular, brilliant path that Sartre has, he has something else. Like Hegel is particularly good at looking at things that happen in an individual's life or in social life and being able to see how the same, the same motivation or the same project can really facilitate things or it can be developed in ways that really inhibit things. And so he's he's really good at being able to, again, like Sartre, in a very detailed way, just sort of nail the ambivalence of 
ways of behaving or social institutions or whatever. And that what doing what that does is it it reveals to you that you can't you can't take for granted that uh, this thing we've developed is going to be good. You know, since there's voting, voting must be good. Or since there are guns, guns must be good. You also can't uh, easily adopt the attitude that says, well, they must be bad. Rather, these Hegel is really good at looking at the complexity of those things and thereby showing you how it's required of you to engage intelligently and, you know, with good judgment in dealing with those things. But so, you know, so I would say that that's the main thing that if I had to pick one thing about Hegel, I would say it's, he is especially brilliant at being able to show how things that we get involved with institutions or technology or whatever, things that we get involved with kind of have a life of their own and that life of their own while in some ways is facilitating in other ways is inhibiting. And indeed, if I can add one last point about that, I guess one of the other things he shows is that things we develop often reveal that ambivalence over time. You know, there'll, there'll be a little uh, honeymoon with a new piece of technology where it seems like, Oh, it only does all these great things. And then after the honeymoon, you see all the bad things. And so he's really good at showing that ambivalence, but he's also really good at showing how it's kind of dynamic, how over time these things reveal that. So I think Hegel is a great thing to read, a great figure to read for the sake of like understanding the, the structures of our world, you know, what, what, what different religions are or what different political institutions are, um, you know, and he's, he's good on psychology too, but you know, there he, he has, you know, you know, maybe 10 or 20 really insightful, but very dense paragraphs where Sartre, you know, has hundreds of pages of this really, really insightful and incisive discussion of these, like of the, how the body functions in sex. Like I, I love Sartre's discussion of the caress. I think that's one of the greatest things he, he offers. It's just so, so insightful about understanding what's happening in sexual touch <clears throat> and then on the other hand, he can talk about, you know, elements of jealousy in a love relationship, or he can talk about what it's like to stand in a line waiting for a bus, you know, like he's, he's, and in every one of those things, it's not just that he can describe them well, he shows you why there is something profound there, you know, so, so I don't, I, I don't think it conflicts with Hegel. And I don't think the things Hegel analyzes about politics conflict with Sartre. But I just think they have their different strengths. And that's, uh, I read these guys, I get, well, I shouldn't just say guys, because I would say the same thing about Hannah Arendt or Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, I read these philosophers because I think, I think they're kind of like a group of really brilliant, mostly European thinkers over a space of about 200 years who are all really working on the same set of issues. And it's a really profound sort of dialogue. And the different writers have uh, have different different uh, avenues into things, and and it it pays so much to learn to inhabit, you know, Hannah Arendt's perspective or Sartre's perspective. And so that's what I, that's that's what I would say about Hegel. You know, I've seen uh, a few people come to a similar position as you on this lately. Like I think Dan Zahavi. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, more people seem to be willing to read all of these philosophers as companions instead of as yeah. uh, competitors. Yeah, and I think I, it's I a really good developing. development. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I do think that we are seeing that a bit more, and uh, yeah, I would really like to see that develop more because I like you know I think it's it's sort of like sometimes people talk about how left wing politics can kind of. Um, undermine itself by certain kinds of infighting, whatever, I think a similar kind of thing, like, man, there are these amazing resources. And instead, often, instead of trying to m marshal that collective power to address problems, uh, philosophical and academic thinking about these things turns into this kind of 
I don't know, quasi incestuous fighting about who said what or whatever. Like, I, I think it's, I think that's that the attempt to distinguish those people, I mean, it has its place, but I think it's really over that card is overplayed in a way that often blunts the force of the real impact on human life that these great thinkers could have. So I am, I am very happy that I, I agree with you about what's happening. I'm very happy that I, I do think I see some greater recognition of the possibility to, to read these people as collaborators and turn the, the collective power of these thinkers to address to address problems. I think that is happening. And I, I think that's a very healthy development. Do you think that has something to do with uh, particularly the French education uh, system of uh, colleges there? One of the things that bother, uh, that boggles my mind is the linguistic turn or um, the turn away from Sartre and existentialism in, in the 70s in France. And particularly the way of somewhat refusing to even reference Sartre when you read Foucault or Derrida or, um, oh, I don't know who else. But, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think um, I th yes, I I do think that you're, the thing you're talking about is is part of this. I, I I'll, I'll put it in my words, which which I think are similar, maybe maybe slightly different, but similar. I mean, I think I think in all kinds of contexts in our lives. You can have a situation where something has to be fought for, and then after you've got it, you have it, and it's easy to have, and so you can live with it without without realizing how fragile it is or how how hard it is to bring it into being. Excuse me. And I do think that what you know, I I think about. I think very highly of Foucault and Derrida and Deleuze. I think those individual figures are pretty, pretty impressive thinkers. And I've learned a lot from reading them. And I think of them as very uh, serious, like very motivated, committed people. But I do think that there is a kind of um, philosophical culture that grew up around them that, uh, well, it often has the rhetoric of political engagement and so on. I think it it has it did often turn into the kind of thing I was actually just talking about this kind of um, you know bickering about academic matters or whatever, and I think part of that is because these guys like Sartre and Merleau Ponty or you know and, and De Beauvoir and Arendt and Heidegger before them in uh, Germany um, and Husserl, like they they brought into being in the twentieth century and and not even just them like surrealists and you know, very anthropologists, so a whole, whole range of uh, intellectuals in France and Germany brought into being this amazing thing, which is essentially uh, existentialist intellectual culture, you know? Like, so I think of figures like Hegel and Nietzsche and Kierkegaard, they're, they're existentialists too, but, the, but there wasn't really an existentialist world movement at that time. But in the 20th century, we had that. Like, in these these figures that I'm talking about were part of this huge thing that developed in the 20th century such that by, I don't know, maybe 1960 or something like that. Um, I think people growing up then, university students then, could take that as just the way the world is and didn't so much see how much that's a thing they, they need to sort of apprentice themselves to and sort of relearn and perpetuate. So I think instead that just seemed like, well, that's the thing that's going on here. And they both could take it for granted and maybe also dismiss it, you know, without realizing its weight. So I do think something did happen there in <coughs> partially in French intellectual culture in the sixties and seventies that, um, that did uh, kind of work, work against the momentum of this really great thing that, was being developed. But then I would also say, you know, speaking of academic culture, uh, academic culture in North America, or university academic culture in North America, especially in relationship to philosophy, 
I think has been very far from uh, supportive of the study of those things. And a lot of philosophy education really in North America is sort of premised on the idea that you don't need to know the history of philosophy and philosophy is, uh, you know, you just need to sharpen your own ability to think critically. And so I think there's a, there's a real, there's a real strong culture in North America that is kind of actively in denial and encourages the act of denial of uh, actively in denial of the, the weight of our philosophical and cultural heritage and the, the need to digest it and, and respond to it. So I think both in the homeland of existentialism in, let's say the sixties and seventies, uh, the, the great momentum of that movement was, was in a certain way undermined by its own success because it just started to seem obvious and familiar and, and became something that people didn't feel that they could, they could be passive towards. They didn't really feel the need to continue the revolution, so to speak. And then in North America, the educational system was unwelcoming of it and often working against its values. So, uh, so I think, yeah, there's, um, it's an amazing human accomplishment in the in the 20th century over 50 years through these figures i think that is the thing that can uh, that can save us and the issue now is to get people uh, it continues to be to get people to pay attention to it like you got to keep keep fighting those fights yeah it's very difficult um and yeah it, so my where I'm not in academia at all. I took a philosophy 101 class, and then everything else has been just my own passion. That's amazing. But, um, That's great. The way that I come in touch with these uh, more academic debates is through the anarchist yeah. um, academics, and um, so what's happened in the past 20 years or so is the anarchists who are doing a lot of social theory have embraced um, Heidegger, Deleuze, yeah. Foucault, Max Stirner. Not a single one of them <laughs> reads. Some might, might talk about Franz Fanon, but they don't read De Beauvoir. They don't read Sartre. They don't read Camus. Yeah. And, and they, should re they should read the critique of dialectical reason, I'd say. I, I'm covering. I'm doing a whole series on that right now, actually. Um yeah just be specifically for anarchists because it is so yeah. relevant and it's just it's amazing to me that like yeah you have uh you know these writers Foucault, Deleuze they write about you know Heidegger they write about Nietzsche and yet their own their own uh forebears it's like they can't handle it they can't yeah. admit them into but we know with Foucault now that his original uh, works were dedicated to her Searle and uh, Ludwig Binswanger, who I talked yeah. about earlier. And yeah, it's just uh, I'm hoping that there's a change there because it's yeah. you can't have one without the other. I mean, I I really just to, to, let me reiterate that one thing, which I I know you're you're sympathetic with this. I do think of you know from what I understand of of uh, anarchism, I think man, you couldn't pick a better book to work on than the Critique of Dialectical Reason. I think it's a uh, that would be tremendously worthwhile for people to study. Uh, but you know, it's a tough book. It's, it's you know, so you, it really requires study, and it's um, so you can see why people often don't want to just pick that up and say, "Oh, I'm going to read it." But but man, that book has so much to offer. I mean, it's all, I also think of that as an underdigested book of our philosophical tradition in general. It's this amazing book by this amazing thinker, and. It just it has never got the level of play, so to speak, that you know being a nothingness did, and it really should because it's it's a uh, well, it's it's insightful. Completely and actually, uh, I think in August or uh, maybe a little later, there's actually going to be a republishing of both volumes as a single volume by Verso right. Books, and nice. Frederick Jameson wrote a new introduction to it. So that's Good. exciting, and hopefully yeah. that does spark some people to pick it up and <laughs> give it a go again. Since yeah, I hope so. Um, 
Man, uh, what? So you did mention you're working on a new book. Yeah. Um, uh, did you want to give any um, spoilers or anything about it? Or? No. I mean, I, I could just say a little bit. Just you know, pretty related to the things I've already been saying. It's uh, it's tentatively titled "To Live in These Times," and my my idea was that that really what the job of philosophy is ultimately is to try to you know you try to comprehend your own world. And so I'm trying to bring, you know, whatever I've learned over the years, studying philosophy and so on, to try to think about what is happening now. And um, and basically that's what led me to think, if you want to understand this world, you have to understand money and computers. And uh, so I've been, I've been, trying to, I mean, I, I try to be a writer who's pretty approachable to a kind of the opposite of the critique of dialectical reason. I try to write books that anybody can read, but that, but I don't want to write, you know, books that are watered down. I try to still be rigorous, but, but I try to write in kind of simple, engaging style. And that's my goal here is to, to write what is still a book of philosophy. So I'll still talk about the same kinds of themes I talk about in adult life or whatever else. But Really, what it's about is trying to understand uh, what's what's happening in economics, which, uh, in my interpretation, mostly means understanding the history of banking, and and then uh, the trying to write about the history of the computer as well to try to understand what what computers are, and as a basis for understanding what's happening in a, in a digital culture, because I think, you know, the thing I'm going to say is nothing new, uh, but I think it's true. I, I think that the, the digital revolution may very well be comparable to the sort of revolution of the printing press, you know, that, that it seems like just a change of some technology, but it brings in a whole new world. And I think that's kind of what's happening now. And so I, I don't have the benefit of, you know, years of study of computer science and functioning in that world, but I've been doing what I can to understand these things. And so I'm trying to write a book, you know, I said before, I think, you know, talk, I was talking about problems of education and the fact that people like, they just don't know what these things are. They're using their smartphone or their money. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to do the work myself of learning enough about those things so that I can write a simple book that a serious minded adult can read and understand such that they're going to say, oh, wow, now I understand what that is, which is never going to substitute for the years of study of actually becoming uh, a computer scientist or something like that. But it's, but it's also not like, but it, it's not like just colorful slogans. Like I'm really trying to sort out how these things work and what, as, as a kind of technology, what this is, or, what money is and how banking practices have developed. So I, I'm very excited about the book. I, th I think I've written a lot of books already and I think this is the one I'm, I'm really going to die happy to have written. I think I, I got myself to the point where I like, Oh, I actually have something to say. I think I might write, I might really be able to write a good book, you know? Uh, so I'm very excited about this. Uh, if it's taken a lot of real research on my part to, try to understand these things and to try to digest them and have something to say. And I personally believe it's extremely important. You know, I'm doing it because I think this is what we need to understand. So as it stands right now, it's got three parts, one about banking, one about uh, computers. And then the last one, which is the one I'm currently working on is just an attempt, not so much to talk about the, the sort of infrastructure of our society, but, but the social side of that, like what is the, world of human diversity that we are encountering in this global technological capitalist world. And so that's what I'm in the midst of now. So I can't quite say where that's going to go. And I also can't say for sure how long it's going to be. I think there's only going to be three parts, but sometimes I start writing things and it turns out they get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. But, but I think I'm on the final section, but I'm very excited about it. And, um, and I'm, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to talk about it because 
because I think it's important and it's important to me and uh, I'm very eager to get it finished. And so I will definitely send you a copy when it's done. Well, it's definitely a, a really difficult task that you set yourself to take uh, such complex ideas and make them available and digestible for uh, someone who has maybe a basic college education. Uh, reading your work so far, I mean, I know some of the things that are going into the sentences you're writing and the way that you're able to um, to express that without having to refer to the jargon or name drop the philosopher. And uh, yeah, it's I think you definitely have the talent to be able to do that. And it's well, thank you. I'm glad you're doing it. Thank you. Um, I like what we have for the interview here. I sure. think that uh, I would definitely like to have you on again if you sure. would like, especially as you're proceeding or finishing up with your new book. I'd, and, I'd love to come back. Yeah. Um, it's, great. it's great to talk to you. So. And uh, is, there, is there anything else that you just wanted to say before the end of the interview? Maybe some links to something to check out? No, I mean, I think I I would say people should take existentialism seriously. I, I hope they'll do that. Uh, I th I would, you know, I really ap appreciate people sh showing an interest in my work. I think that book, Adult Life, is a great one to turn to. I have another one that I published just before that called Sites of Exposure, which I also think um, is a pretty easy one for people to pick up. It's a, it's about politics and art. Uh but uh, those two books, Adult Life and Sites of Exposure, I would I would think it'd be great if somebody wanted to turn to them because I, I think they're books where you can just start reading them and you don't you don't it's they're not going to be those books where you think oh I don't want to dig through this like I think they're pretty pretty accessible. I'd also be thrilled to have anybody look at my YouTube lectures. I mean I'm trying to just be a university teacher you know and talk about the things I would teach in courses, but in the same way, you know I try to teach in a simple and engaging way that people can just sit down and listen to. And uh, I'm I'm talking about the things I think are important. I think people should learn about Hegel and Sartre and Plato and all the other things. So I, I, uh, I hope some people will turn to those, but, and let me also say, I'm really grateful to you for talking with me. It's, it's, it's really nice to talk to you because you're very sympathetic to the things I'm saying. And uh, it's, it's really nice to interact, but I appreciate the, uh, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to just get these words out there. Well, absolutely. I appreciate it as well. And then I'll make sure anything you want in the show description, I'll link to it okay. and everything else. Great. 